So today I'm talking to Richard Brendan, founder and owner of Richard Brendan and of Jancis Robinson Wine Collection, both of which lines we carry on our marketplace at Corvin.com. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Lindsay. Thanks for having me today. Good to see you. Um, how are things on the other side of the pond right now? Yeah, they're good. I think um, we've, we've been in a pretty strict lockdown uh, since uh, the beginning of January or even the end of December. Um, but I think there are some really positive signs at the moment. Um, the vaccine rollout seems to be going well. Um, COVID numbers are going down. And uh, finally, there's a, a sort of a, a date in mind where indoor dining and hospitality should be able to open again. Hopefully from, from mid-May, uh, it starts to look a lot more like like it used to look. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> um, how have you seen the industry change during the pandemic? Hospitality or? Yeah, yeah I mean. Hospitality, yeah. It's, it's been closed a lot in the UK is the reality. Um, we had, we had a, a, a point in the summer, last summer, where things were open, um, but with still quite, quite a lot of restrictions in terms of the number of people that were allowed to dine together. And then as the levels of COVID started to get worse in, in the fall, those restrictions got much stricter. It was only right. people from one household that were allowed to dine together. Um, and then unfortunately it had to close again. So right. um, yeah, it's, it's been really rough on, on the hospitality industry. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think clarity is the, the thing that the hospitality industry really needs. And, you know, it's, it's so hard when you, you, you don't know if you're allowed to open or not and you, yeah. you can't make plans. So I think now hopefully they should be able to make plans with, with more confidence yeah, now it impacts so many people. Um, yeah. So switching gears a little bit, how, how did you get into the glass making business? Um, so I, well, I studied product design. So that was really the the, the starting point of my journey. And um, in my final year of university, I actually designed a product, not, not in glass, but in ceramics. Uh, so my, my brand started with Bone China mm -hmm. and uh one of our collections that we still sell today is called Reflect. It's mm -hmm. uh, a reflective teacup. And the reason I designed that um, was I, I, whilst I was studying, I used to work at a pub on Portobello Road in London. And uh, Portobello Road's a big antiques market. Okay, and yeah. over a number of weeks, I started to realize there were hundreds and thousands of beautiful antique tea sources, uh, but there weren't nearly as many cups. Um, mm. And it turned out from talking to antique dealers, uh, the reason for that was people break cups a lot more than they break sources. So, <laughs> so I had this idea of I could make a cup that was mirrored on the outside and you put it onto the tea saucer, it would reflect the pattern. Um, oh, cool. And I went to Stoke-on-Trent in, uh, in the north of England and I found someone who thought they could make it. Um, Stoke-on-Trent's the, the traditional centre of British ceramics. Um, right, yeah. So, so yeah, I found, I found someone to make it, made a prototype, uh, showed that at my degree show and, and one thing led to another. And before I had a brand or really any business idea, I, I had a product that was selling. Um, <laughs> and then... I think really what that collection did is it taught me all about the history of British ceramics because I was buying antique tea sources. Um, I fell in love with the, the potteries in Stoke-on-Trent and this incredible industry that's been there for over 300 years. Um, and I also realized that, you know, these phenomenally skillful craftspeople that we work with, um, these were skills that we were losing at a really frightening rate um and my my brand and our business is all about trying to make products that are as good as they can be mm -hmm. and a lot of the time you can only do that if you're working with really really good craftspeople so right. um i suppose at that point part of our our purpose became about supporting and trying to regenerate these industries um and ceramics very naturally led into design and glass um i think exactly the same philosophy uh goes into our our glass and our crystal designs as it does with our bone china i tend to take inspiration from the past i look at what 
we've made, uh, you know, in Europe, particularly over the last um, 300 or 400 years. And I, I look for beautiful things and I look for things that were really good. And I generally try and uh, come up with a way of reinterpreting what was beautiful and, and making it more contemporary and more relevant for today's consumer. Um, so it, it, with glassware, we started with cut crystal um, mm -hmm. and uh, my first collection of cut crystal was the diamond collection, uh, which, uh, I think you've got on online as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's got beautiful diamond cut ap applied to just the bottom third of the pieces and on the bottom of the glass. Um, right. so, so yeah, that's kind of how cool. it came about. Um, can you explain bone China? I'm sure I'm not the sure. only one who doesn't completely understand it. And what is no, it, what does it do for your products? Yeah. What's. I mean, bone, bone China is the strongest form of porcelain. And okay. um, in, in the 17th century, um, everyone in Europe wanted to make porcelain mm -hmm. um, because uh, porcelain started to be imported from China and Japan. Mm -hmm. And Europeans had never seen um, ceramics of that quality before. Um, it was kind of known as white gold. It was like the most expensive mm -hmm. uh, thing at the time. And um, all, of the, all of the countries around Europe started trying to make porcelain. And in Germany, they figured it out first, uh, as you can imagine. And then the French figured it out. <laughs> Uh, and in England, we were making something that was called soft paste porcelain, and it wasn't nearly as hard or as strong, but the designs and the decorations were incredible. Um, and then there was actually a, a potter called uh, Josiah uh, Spode, um, who was messing around, experimenting with different ingredients. And he realized if you actually put uh, cattle bone ash into the ceramic mix, um, it resulted in a, uh, a type of porcelain that was a lot uh, whiter than, uh, than regular porcelain, um, and it was even stronger. Um, oh, wow. So, so that was how it began. Is that still how it's made today? It is, yeah. So, so it's, it's a, a kind of a sustainability thing. This is like from like slaughtered exactly, cattle? exactly. Wow. Oh. So, yeah, so it's, it's pretty literal. Yeah. Yeah, very <laughs> literal. And I don't think anyone really realizes that. No, that's, that's fact fascinating. That's name. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a byproduct from obviously uh, from, you know, the, the cattle industry. And um, yeah, so that's, that's how, cool. how it's made. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's that's fascinating. Um, now, this might be a little bit of a neophyte question, but what what makes crystal versus glass? <laughs> it's a very good question. Okay. And um, because, I, uh, because I've worked with glassmakers in different countries, I think I have the ability to be a bit more, um, I'm not sure what the right term is, but I think I can be a bit more kind of subjective on it. And I think that if you spoke to someone in the Czech Republic, they would tell you crystal had to have 24% lead oxide in it, or it's not crystal. If you spoke to someone in Waterford in Ireland, they'd probably tell you it had to have 32% lead oxide in it. Yet, if you spoke to someone in um, Murano in Italy, they would tell you it doesn't have to have any lead oxide in it mm -hmm. at all. So as long as it's called Murano, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think crystal is a bit of a silly word i i, I huh. don't think you can actually say there's something particularly that makes glass crystal oh, there's, so there's no like industry regulation no on, the, on it, its it, amount of the like, lead oxide in it. it exactly okay. and and actually the crystal we produce is lead free um oh, okay. and you know years ago some people would have said well if it's lead free it's not crystal it's all to do with at the end of the day it's all to do with the purity and the quality of the glass you've got other types of glass which are much lower quality things like soda lime glass it's not as strong it's not as beautiful it's the sort of thing when you put it in your dishwasher and the glass starts to go dull because yeah. it's not as hard so really i think Crystal to me is to do with the quality of the glass and the purity of the glass. And like I said, we, we're now completely lead free crystal for our cut crystal and our, our wine glasses. And the advantages of that are that the glass is very hard. 
um so it's dishwasher safe um and for the wine thing. glasses yeah Beautiful exactly thing. i'm exactly. always hand washing glasses and it yeah more annoying nobody wants yours. to be doing that <laughs> <laughs> i have a two-year-old running around like you know trying to break things all the time. yeah and i think you know historically the reason why cut crystal started was if you put lead oxide in glass it makes the glass a lot softer and if the glass is softer it's really good for cutting um because if you think back in the day they didn't have particularly sophisticated technology for cutting so the glass needed to be softer if it was really hard they wouldn't have been able to hand cut oh, the glass right, yeah. um but now with technology and better machines you don't need that softness so actually having a harder glass is is good uh, for a durability point of view um, and also from an environmental point of view, um, you know, if there's lead oxide in the glass, inevitably there's waste and waste can end up getting into the environment and you don't really want lead getting into the environment. Um, I think there have been a lot of rumours, which I don't personally believe in, uh, about, you know, lead glass being dangerous to drink out of. Um, actually, I think the amount of lead that can leach out to the glass is uh, so minuscule it really doesn't cause any problems right. yeah. um, but that, that's a whole separate topic <laughs> <laughs> that's the controversial side of the glassware industry mm -hmm. um i think that was people who were making <laughs> lead free glass just trying to write yeah. off the people who were making lead it crystal. sounds like a 60 minutes <laughs> 60 minute segment or something that they needed yeah. to plug in um <laughs> So it sounds like you're, you, so you're very hands-on in the design process then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So these are yeah. all very, um, that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So can we, let's switch gears to the Jancis Robinson line. Yeah. Um, how did you get connected with her? Um, were you, were you already connected with her in the business? No. So um, I, one of the very first journalists who ever wrote about my work, literally as I, left university and I had just my reflective teacups and the antique sources was a, a journalist uh, is a journalist called Lucia van der Post um, who writes about design for the Financial Times mm -hmm. and um, Jancis also writes for the Financial Times um, she's been the wine writer there for uh, a, a very long time um, so when I decided I wanted to design wine glasses I knew I needed to partner with a really, really top expert because as much as I'm good at designing and I uh, know that we work with really great craftspeople and manufacturers, uh, I was not a wine expert. And even if I did lots of research, I wouldn't have that credibility that, you know, Jancis would bring. And right. I, I spoke to, you know, I, I love food and drink at that point. Uh, I, 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 hadn't done any studying about wine, which I've now started. Um, but I spoke to my friends who worked in the wine industry and I said, who, who should I try and collaborate with? And everyone I spoke to just kept on saying Jancis. Um, so I was like, okay, well, it sounds like that's who I need to talk to. Uh, so I was introduced to Jancis via uh, Lucia van der Post at the FT. And um, that was that was how it all began. That's amazing. Yeah, she's she's a luminary. Um, that takes me back to uh, my days at the hotel school at Cornell. We would uh, the wines class, the famous yeah. wines class there. All the videos that that Professor Mukoski, I think now retired since retired, all the videos he put on were of Jancis Robinson. Yeah. And they were like it was always like very relaxing music background yeah. and her voice. And you kind of doze off and like dream that you were like in the wine country and everything. But no, she's she's incredible. Um it's a beautiful design. Um, so what was that design process like? Like how much input did she have versus, versus yeah, you? I the design process was incredible actually it was probably yeah. no what not probably is still today my absolute favorite collaboration in terms of how the design process worked uh, because and it successful, was successful so, right <laughs> yeah i mean it was so it was such a efficient design process you know i sat down with jancis and we had a meeting and in that meeting jancis explain to me exactly what needed to be in the collection um, and she started with the wine glass uh, and said look I honestly believe 
and and this is my opinion, but I think it makes total sense that you only need one wine glass for absolutely everything, as long as it's the right glass. Um, and, you know, I think Chances is one of the best wine tasters in the world. And if one of the best wine tasters in the world tells you they can't tell the difference between one wine and, you know, you might find the glass, Janice explained, you might find a particular glass for a particular wine that right. it increases how good it is by one or two percent. Mm -hmm. But for a purely practical reason and to try and uh, demystify the world of wine, which I think Janice does a lot, she's like, we're just going to make a wine glass that's really, really good. Um, so she explained to me that the, the thickness of the glass was massively important. Um, she wanted the, the thickness of the rim to be absolutely as fine as possible. Um, she wanted the widest part of the bowl on the wine glass to be um, a sixth of a bottle, so 125 milliliters, uh, because that's a really nice size pour. And also if you're you know, a sommelier pouring at a table and you've got a table of uh, four, you know, you, you've got a top up for everyone or you've got a table for six, you know, everyone's going to get a glass of wine. Um, and Janice has explained, you know, the, the lovely thing about that is if the widest point of the glass is 125 milliliters, it also means that's where you've got maximum surface area. So it will allow all of the aromas to get out of the wine. And obviously, taste is all to do with aroma and aromatics um and it is the most important thing when you're tasting wine you know oh, yeah. uh so so that was the the thinking there um and then chances wanted the wine glass to taper in uh to the smallest possible opening that you could still get your nose into the glass and, and smell the wine uh, and wanted the glass to be quite tall as well. So when you swirl the wine, there's plenty of space and, you know, wine's not coming, flying out of your glass. That's quite important. Um, and then the, the stem uh, and, and the overall height of the glass, Janice's wanted the glass to fit in domestic dishwashers, um, you know, as well as commercial dish, dishwashers, because for practicality, that's really important. Um, and actually, you know, Janice's explained to me, that she'd never broken a glass in the dishwasher. Um, you know, all the breakages that happen were when hand washing or polishing wow. and handling the glass. As long as you load your dishwasher sensibly and you don't have things that can fall on the glasses, right. uh, the dishwasher won't break them. Um, wow. So, so that was the like, you know, that was probably half an hour explaining to me exactly, and we're talking about the wine glass, and then Janice has got on to decanters and said that you know she really didn't think anyone had made this distinction properly you need to decant for very different reasons depending on what type of wine you're decanting um, if you're decanting a old or mature uh, red wine uh, you're really decanting to get the wine off the sediment um, and then a lot of the time you don't want those wines to get much oxygen you know they're 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 quite fragile a lot of mature wines so actually we designed a uh, decanter for mature wine that's a bottle shape um, with very little surface area when the wine's decanted so not much oxygen's getting to the wine and a stopper uh, and the stoppers to reduce additional airflow to the wine um, whereas for young wines it's all about getting oxygen into the wine that's the purpose you're trying to open up these kind of young tense probably not quite ready to drink wine so oxygen speeds up that process so right. the young wine decanter is the opposite it's big it's bulbous it's got big surface area it's got this nice long neck so you can swirl the wine around and get oxygen into the wine um and then the the final piece in the collection the uh water glass um which i'm actually drinking out of right now <laughs> it's exactly the same shape oh, as the wine glass so chances uh rightly so doesn't really believe in drinking uh wine out of a stemless um glass like, because you, from the same school <laughs> yeah you, i don't like affect, the stemless glass for wine yeah, no. yeah exactly you affect the temperature yeah. you can't swirl you know all of yeah. these things um and i think what 
we, we, we suggested a stemless wine glass and Janice said, well, look, we can call it a water glass because it's very practical and sensible to set a table with a water glass and a wine glass. And you should drink some water um, whilst you're drinking wine because right. that's that's responsible. Um, and so we did that. And, and, and then we said, but, you know, if you do drink wine out of it, it's the best stemless wine glass you can get as well. That's a good compromise. Yeah. So it yeah. sounds like you've had a bit of a journey on in terms of wine education. Absolutely. I mean, did, that, did, did your collaboration with Jancis kind of kick that off? Yeah, it definitely um, it definitely accelerated my uh, desire, I think, to, to actually learn about wine. Yeah. And um, during during the last lockdown uh, in the UK, um, my wife and I actually uh, started studying. So we did our WSET oh, awesome. twos. So yeah, very happy. Yeah. I passed passed that. So very uh, good. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a WSET, whatever the advanced one. It's called. It's different now, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, three same. three or diploma. I didn't do diploma. So whatever okay. was before diploma, I completed. Yeah. Um, so how did you, that's a great way to spend your time during Absolutely, lockdown. Yeah. I mean, really, so really many good people, some people lockdown. were just watching Netflix, you know? Yeah, no, it was, it was a good way of doing it. And yeah. um, we used, I used my Coravan a lot during that, actually, a lot. Excellent. Uh, because we had yeah. 25 bottles of wine delivered for a seven week course. And wow. um, I didn't really think we should be drinking five bottles of wine <laughs> every week. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we Coravan days and yeah. uh, drank them sensibly and slowly uh, awesome. over a period of time. So that was good. And, uh, you know, in, in our travels before we started to do that, whenever we were traveling, we, we started to make sure we go to any wine regions that we're near um and to to go around vineyards and and to learn about wine in in situ which i think is the best way to do it yeah absolutely yeah that that's that's amazing um the corvin certainly enables uh wine tasting in a different way than um than before it came along so yeah it really does i mean i i love it because i think what what it's done for me is it means i spend more money on the wine I buy to buy better quality sure. wine and I just have a, a glass and enjoy it and don't feel like I need to drink a whole bottle quickly absolutely yeah and um also I think it's lovely if you you know if you want to drink multiple glasses of wine in an evening um and I don't drink as much white wine as I drink red wine so it, it kind of gives me a lot more flexibility right. on what I can drink yeah definitely and there's always sometimes disagreement between you and your spouse or yeah. you know, what you should pair with. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about Corvin. I, I use it in my, in my life, daily life as well. So yeah, that's great to hear. Um, so with that, our company mission uh, at Corvin is to change the way the world experiences wine. What is your favorite wine experience or just a favorite wine experience that comes to sure. mind? Sure. Yeah, it's, I think for me, I, I'm, I'm not one of those people that has like one yeah, and, uh, moment where they're yeah. like, that was it. I wish I did. I well, the epiphany or it. head explodes. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. I really wish I had Fireworks. I think yeah. the reality is I've liked wine since I was uh, just about old enough to drink wine. And the older <laughs> I've got, the more I've learned about it and the more yep. I've enjoyed it. Um, but I think for me, probably a couple of things, a couple of moments, I suppose. Um, one was in New Zealand. Um, we had been traveling all around the different wine regions in New Zealand. And um, we were staying in Wanaka in central Otago. And there's a really lovely little restaurant there, which I think is only open in the summer, uh, called the White House. And it looks like a little Greek building and they serve Mediterranean food and they have a wine list that's just with, written on a on a chalkboard. Um, and, you know, when the bottles are gone, they're crossed out. And we had a bottle of well, we were about to order something else. And the table next to us was overhearing our conversation about what wine to order. And just before we ordered, they said, if I were you, I would order the Amersfield uh, 2013. Mm. 
And I don't know, I mean, Amersfield's wonderful um, anyway, but I, I guess the 2013 was a particularly good vintage and we got some good, uh, good local knowledge on that. And it was, you know, the wine was fantastic, but I think it was just one of those settings where everything was so good. Yeah. You know, sometimes you drink a really good bottle of wine, but you're not in the right environment. You're sitting on your couch. <laughs> exactly. Or you've had yeah. a bad day and it's not right. as good. But this was one of those moments where everything was just really, really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think we had a we had another of those kind of experiences in Rioja, um visiting um, uh, CVNE and uh, Cune's uh, different wineries um, in Rioja and that there are distributed for the wine glass in Spain. And um, one of their oh, Rioja. vineyards in Rioja. Uh, yeah, you exactly. Say, you mean we don't have, okay, okay, okay. I, I, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know if I was misunder, mishearing what you were saying. Okay. So yeah, we were going around the various uh, vineyards and and wineries of uh, of CVNE, and one of their wineries is called Contino, and um, it's just this really, really beautiful uh vineyard where all of the wines they produce are just from a single vineyard, which is unusual for uh, for Rioja because. You know, a lot of the time it's wine from lots and lots of different vineyards which are blended, but this is a, a single vineyard and it's just really beautiful. There's a house from like the 15th century and um, we did a tasting of all of their different wines okay. and, and their brand reserve. I can't remember what year it was, but it was, yeah, really fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I was hoping that this question would transport me to different place <laughs> yeah <laughs> like we haven't been able to go to in a long time so it did just that oh man it sounds great um so my last question is just anything you'd like to plug or anything um on the horizon for for Richard Brendan um that you want to talk tell our customers about yeah I, I can't give you all the information uh, it's top yet. some of it's top it's, secret i understand it's, it's top secret but i i'm desperate to talk about it okay <laughs> um so we didn't we didn't launch any products last year because of the pandemic we we just kind of put everything on hold i think like a lot of businesses we we kind of hit the brakes in april yeah. and we waited and we kind of waited to see how things were working and fortunately our sales recovered really really well in q4 last Great. year uh, so now we're, we're getting ready to launch all the products we hadn't launched. And the next launch is going to be in the middle of April. Um, it's a collection of cocktail glasses, which I think will complement the Jancis uh, collection Fantastic. really, really nicely. Awesome. Um, and we have samples. We, we're starting our sales outreach and our uh, press outreach and um even with mixologists as well. And yeah, the response has been phenomenal so far. So Fabulous. in April, we'll be able to unveil that. And cool. uh, I'm excited for, for everyone to see it. Well, thank you so much uh, for talking with me today. And uh, if you're interested in, in any of the Richard Brendan and Jancis Robertson glassware, you can go to corvin.com. Check out the marketplace. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, lovely to see you.